Hi everyone, welcome to Success and Sales, Hacks and Chats with Mike McConnell and I have a very special guest. We have Karen Green joining me today. Karen, thanks for being a guest on the show. Welcome, hello. Karen's a business mentor, speaker and the author of the best-selling book, Recipe for Success, The Ingredients of a Profitable Food Business. And we're going to figure out how she got to where she is. So we're going to start with your background, if that's okay, Karen. So could you share with us where you were born and what it was like for you growing up? Yeah, so I was born uh, in Newbury um, in Berkshire and um, grew up. Uh, my father was a um, director of a department store, so um, I grew up with retail, was kind of born into it. Um, from the age of 14, was um, a Saturday girl on a variety, not food, but on a variety of different um, areas uh, like... Um, haberdashery and um, dress fabrics. So I could pretty much measure a meter of fabric with my bare hands because I've did it so many right. times. It's a very useful skill. You never know when you might need that. No. Uh, I then went on to uni um, and studied management science, but that was kind of like a lot of retail marketing. And then went and started my career with Tesco as a buyer and then um, moved from Tesco's to Boots and spent 14 years there as a buyer, um, looking after new product development and um, ultimately doing some sales as well for them on their contract manufacturing side. So yes, a highly, highly corporate start to life. So what was it like as, as a buyer then? I mean, it, I mean, as a, is, it like, is it like where you, you go in as like a mystery shopper or something? I mean, that, that's the first impression I get. What's it like? <laughs> No, it's very much head office based. Um, so at Tesco's, I was buying fish and at Boots, I was buying vitamins largely. I mean, I did do some food buying as well. But so as the Boots buyer for vitamins, because we were the market leaders, you get a lot of people come to you with new ideas, new products. Uh, we also had our own label, Boots brand of vitamins, which I managed. Um, so quite a broad range of things and actually to be honest the stores themselves were probably a source of, of frustration for us because we would do all this great work and then they would not implement it so <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge was there anything that you you did initially to maybe help with that or was that something something that you never really overcame while you were there with the store with shops yeah uh yeah we did i mean we developed um we did like a training manual for the stores because if you think about vitamins and minerals they're qu it's quite a complicated area and and all the different supplements and you know from cod liver oil to ginkgo biloba to uh just your straight vitamins they're so it's so complicated so we did actually produce a, a really good manual for them to to train them we tried to look at helping people shop better it was the first time that i came across the paradox of choice um right so if you if you watched people buying vitamins they walk up and down and up and down and a lot of the time just walk away because they just go oh i don't know what i want and walk away and it's interesting more recently there's been some research in food that showed that if people were offered 20 jams or five jams the ones that only offered the five jams actually bought more jam than the off the ones offered 20 jams which kind of is not all to do with why i think aldi and lidl are so successful but i think it just makes the shopping experience a lot easier so um that was something that we looked at we only we cut back to only having our own label plus a brand and maybe one other when it was a big section. So there was a lot of changes that we made to try and make it easier for the, for the people to shop and therefore the stores to sell. It seems like just one of the one of the benefits of testing, I guess, because some people listening might be thinking, oh, well, surely if, if you're selling 20 jams, then people would buy 20. But then if you sell them in packs of five, people would probably buy more than four, which makes it higher than... 20 so, so it seems like there's a almost a power of testing in that i mean was there anything else that you found that might be a little bit unusual to someone that doesn't know the industry um i think the industry has changed a lot since since 
I was a buyer because now you have the the grocery um, suppliers code of practice in place. But I think something that always surprises my startups is how much more they need to invest if they're going to a retailer. So if you think um, I'm going to sell it to the retailer for a pound um, and they're going to sell it for I don't know, 175, you go, okay, there's the margin. They're making a decent amount of money. Um, I'm making a decent amount of money, that's it. But then on top of that, especially with people like Ocado, although they are just about to fall under Descop, um, they will ask for, um, obviously, margin maintained promotions or, or advertising or sampling or paying reviewers to to review the products that's one that always surprises people that Ocado you know all those reviews you see on Ocado actually the supplier is, has paid for those products to be sent to them not paid for good reviews or bad reviews but just paid for somebody to review their products Okay. That's probably that, that's probably not something that um the people would be shocked about, I'd imagine, because I mean I guess nowadays people you know, people that have like the, the, the large followings or the influencers or whatever it happens to be, they, they they'll tend to be the people that that get you know, are offered the products to try and then just give an honest review on on the product. I mean I, I mean it's probably more more frequent in other industries as well, like clothing and things like that. I mean, food as well. I mean, I'd imagine it, it goes on, uh, but I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought it was as prevalent as you say it would be. What caused you to to stop that? Then was there a particular moment or anything? Because you, what you told me, you moved on to other things. So, what was the uh, de defining moment for you? I think for me. I, I mean, I spent 14 years at Boots and it, was a, it is a big corporate environment. And I think by nature, I'm probably more entrepreneurial. And I stayed quite a while. I had, it was a good place to have my children because it was a very structured environment and, and mm -hmm. really structured hours. But once my children were getting a little bit older and to be honest, I was kind of going, I'm not sure I fit here. Um, and there was an right. opportunity that came up for redundancy, um, like a voluntary redundancy. And I thought, well, actually, let's let's take it. You know, yeah. it sounds like a good plan. So um, I took the redundancy and then applied. In fact, I was given a really good um, outplacement package, which is where I learned a lot about how to build a CV, how to, to go and speak to people, which has really held me in good stead, actually. Um, and then I started initially with, um, with a fizzy pop manufacturer, um, which I did for about a year, but that really wasn't very food and I really wanted to do food. Um, but one of the things which I still think is prevalent today in the food industry is if you haven't got food experience, they don't want to take you on. So, um, uh -huh. So I had a year of fizzy pop and then I was approached to go and look after fish actually again, uh, supplying into Asda. And from there, um, yeah, I probably spent the next six or seven years working in different roles and then um, thought that it might be a nice idea to do something completely different. And so whilst I was working, um, I, think I was selling coleslaw actually, Right. Um, I went and did a, um, actually it was a Paul McKenna seven days to change your life course. Um, right. and I did give a speech actually at the beginning of this year saying how Paul McKenna bankrupted me, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> for legal, I did ask them beforehand. I said, what do you reckon legally? And they said, well, if you can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... so yeah, I did this, um, this change your life in seven days and decided, you know, my passion lay in health and fitness. So I did a personal trainer's qualification, studied nutrition, um, and then basically bought a gym, which was local to my house, um, on personal loans and a couple of credit cards, actually. <laughs> um, which was in 2006, just before it you know, the credit crunch and everything of, of 2009. Um, and that was quite a big revelation going from a big corporate, even big food corporates to a small local 
business. Um, so I learned a lot about local marketing and um, managing a small team, dealing with the public, because, you know, when you're closeted away at head office, however many uh, days you go and work in store to, to see what it's like, it's not like actually running it on a day to day basis. Um, but then in 2009, Credit Crunch hit. Um, Nat West actually ran an advert to say how to save money and they said cancel your gym membership and we lost about 30% of our members in two months because most gyms actually wow. um, make money out of people who don't turn up as opposed to the people that do. Yeah. Um, so to cut a long story short, by then I was also doing some consultancy work um, and I, I, one contract came to an end. I didn't have another one in place. So I just thought, you know what? I think it's time. God is telling me it's time to, to wrap this up. So I closed. <laughs> um, I had all the debt that I'd borrowed on the personal credit cards, uh, plus some money secured against the house. And I just went, I think the only real way out of doing this is bankruptcy. So I declared bankruptcy, um, which was tough. Like what what sort of learning curve did you have to experience then going from the, the corporate world to having the gym? Because it to some people that can be a big leap, but then there could be lessons that you learned from corporate that made the gym or an experience that little bit easier, I guess. So what was the, the learning curve like and how did you actually get the gym off the ground? I suppose the the fundamentals of marketing um have always been with me so if you think about starting with with my studies in 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 retail marketing and then tesco's and then boots and, and all the different roles i did at boots you're always thinking about how do you develop a product to sell to a consumer who is your consumer who is your customer and i think that was very much the same it was like who who is going to come to the gym and what are we going to sell to them in terms of packages um and how are we going to market that? So, so the, the project planning of putting together an annual plan, which I guess now is probably, you know, with, with social media planning is probably more, more prevalent, but there wasn't social media in those days. So putting together, you know, leaflets. So you would leaflet at New Year or you would leaflet at, in September when people go back to school and therefore they want to go back to the gym, things like that. So I think, yeah, marketing, customer awareness was, was inherent even at those early days so was it simply the actual running of the gym then that you think was was new or or not i mean what was the the kind of things that you had to learn in order to make the gym work i think there was two things really one was operational so yes running the gym so you know unplugging the shower when it got blocked up with someone else's hair or sorting out the toilets or um the practical side of it dealing with customers on, a, on an actual face-to-face -face basis who might not be happy or might be happy either way um dealing with a member of staff who stole money from us um those those day-to-day -day practicalities and then the second one which actually probably leads on from the person who stole money is dealing with people who who uh prey on vulnerable companies and vulnerable people um and that's something i feel quite strongly about now with the job that you know the mentoring and the support i do now and the reason i wrote the book um i still come across people who who are doing that and i think i was shocked because when you work for somebody like boots it's very corporate and people say they're going to do what they say they're going to do and it's not quite so um wild west cowboy land which which is what i came across a couple of times so you you seem to have been through a lot karen from the tesco to the boots to trying to go through your own thing and then the ultimately the the bankruptcy as well so what sort of lessons did you take into the consultancy work that you sort of use to help you guide you at this moment um I think that I think the resilience of reinvention, I think, is is really important. So, you know, bankruptcy 
is not the end of the world. And um, I think, and I didn't really see it as the end of the world. I just saw it as a kind of like, okay, you know, learn from it. And I did learn from it, you know, not to get myself into debt. I think that's something I always say to people, I was giving a talk last year, a workshop at Nottingham Trent Uni, and um, there was a guy who was going to sell his house to, to fund the business. And I said, seriously, seriously, don't do it. Try and find, and there's lots of other ways of raising money. Don't, don't mortgage your whole life just for this business. Um, and I think I'm quite um, open to risk. You know, when the financial advisors go, what's your degree of, of risk? Yeah. I, I'm a very open, interested, happy to take risks person. But I think what that taught me was to be more cautious um, about risk. Um, because I think, I think when you get a new idea, and especially the entrepreneurs that I meet now, they are so full of the enthusiasm and so full of excitement, which is absolutely brilliant. But then you meet them two years later and they're absolutely exhausted. And it's how, yes. you, how you actually uh, funnel that and, and pace it so that they aren't getting themselves into a mess. Because I was working every hour I got sent with that business. Um, because by, by year three, I was also back doing consultancy to keep, keep my family afloat because actually it wasn't making very much money. And that's the other thing I see that a lot of food businesses and startups do it as a side hustle. Um, and you know, you'll read the books that go, Oh, you can do a side hustle and you do a side. I don't know if you've done a side hustle, but suddenly you're working every hour. God sends. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea behind this, the side hustle, I think is something that people need to realise is that you are having, like, two jobs at that point. So it's not like your side hustle is an hour a day or two hours a day. It's, like, an extra six or seven hours a day. And nine times out of ten is they're not straight through either. You could be doing an hour or two in the morning before you go to work and then three or four hours before, you know, before like, you like food or, or going to bed or whatever the case is. So you are working, at, you know, you might even be working during dinner times or whatever it is. So you never really switch off. And I guess if you've got that job as well, yeah, you've got the financial security and, and comfort so you can do those things, maybe even take more risks. But then you've always got the element of, well, you need to be smart with how you use your energy and how you spend your time. Otherwise, it's not going to be, as you say, you know, there are there are startups out there, the people out there that are borderlining on, on burning out and needing to take like a month or three sabbatical because they, they run themselves into the ground. So it's definitely a hard lesson to learn. and It seems to be something that you've had to learn as well. So after you decided to declare bankruptcy, after you've gone through all of the, the ups and downs of having the gym as well, how did you, how did you take your, your next steps there? Because you, you are a consultant, you're also an author as well. So how, how did you get to that point? So what I did sort of after that was, was work for a variety of food companies as an interim. So basically as a temp, commercial director um, and I did some work with a ready meals company with um, sandwiches supplying into Sainsbury's supplying into Tesco's with ready meals um, and yeah made made a good living um, out of that um, and then I suppose two things really happened one i'd always wanted to move um i i own a um a place now in france and i wanted to move to france where and while my children were young that wasn't easy because obviously they're at school but once my daughter went to uni i always said that i wanted to move to france and you can't really run a food business from france that's as hands-on as some of these were um and then the other thing that happened was i did a stint as a commercial director for a frozen food company and when I joined them, they got themselves into a bit of a muddle. They'd sold into one of the big high street retailers and also were doing a big contract packing gig. And unfortunately, hadn't really negotiated a very good price. So they were making probably about 4% gross margin, which if you put it in context, I would target most of my clients to be going for between 30 and 50% depending on the, the product. 
four percent's not enough and we were in an inflationary position and all the prices went up and i tried to put prices through and basically to cut a long story short the retailer said no um and the business went into administration and i kind of was very very unhappy about how it was handled and what happened and decided at that point i was going to write a book to at the time to let people know how difficult it is to deal with the retailers and then over the next couple of years i kind of thought well you know what i still want to work in this industry i don't want to write something that's a real whistleblower piece so it softened and it turned into the book that i wrote which was recipe for success which um is very much aimed at startups and second stage businesses and how to actually create a profitable business and what the pitfalls are and where your money can disappear um, and how to stop that happening and how to negotiate with the retailers and how to overcome some of the um, the difficult hurdles that they put in place. So from from your experience then, I mean, what what hurdles do you find that food businesses do actually experience then? And how would you say, you know, particularly with, with the way businesses are run now, you know, a lot of it is, is online now. So... Amazon buying Whole Foods, you know, as of this recording at least, was something that has changed the food industry somewhat, or at least it plans to. So what? how would you, as someone that wanted to start a food business or get involved with that, how would you actually get involved with it and how would you overcome some of those pitfalls yourself? So if you're, if you're starting from scratch, the biggest challenge is is making the product well one of the biggest problems is making the product so you've kind of got two choices you you either make it yourself or you make it get someone else to make it for you um and if you try and get someone to make it for you it's very very difficult to find a manufacturer because you're only a startup you've got no proof that actually what your your great idea is going to sell and therefore the manufacturer doesn't really want to work with you or the manufacturer is quite happy to work for you but as i've got one this morning who's given me a quote for a client of mine he wants him to produce ten thousand units um which is not an unrealistic number but if these are going to retail maybe for three quid that's um and we're gonna have to buy them maybe for 150 he's gonna actually have to invest fifteen thousand pounds in stock before we yep. even start so we're already into a cash flow challenge. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest problems for food startups is, is cash flow. Um, and there are businesses, Snaffling Pig, um, I don't know if you've come across them, they make um, pork scratchings. Nick, who's the owner, and I have done a couple of speaking gigs now, actually. And he, in the early days, didn't borrow any money. He started that business with 500 pounds and he's kept it going. Um, I think they have had some um, investments since, but not, not in the early stages. Um, but but to, to get a decent looking product, to get the product designed, um, both from a recipe point of view, but also from a packaging point of view, takes money and expertise. And a lot of people who come into the food industry which is where i come in don't have any experience of the food industry so they come in and they make a lot of mistakes they pay too much for design they pay too much maybe for pr or or for digital marketing um as indeed i did when i had my gym to be honest when i first came out of corporate life and i'm like oh well yeah i'll, I'll get an agency to do my pr well you don't need an agency to do your pr not until you get a bit bigger uh, and it costs money yeah. Um, so it's thinking that through and then obviously when you do think about going in and, and selling your product it is the hierarchy of how you how you take away the risk for the for a retailer so if your object your objective for the business is to be distributed in all the major retailers those buyers will be looking at your product and going well if I take your products, I've got to take something else off the shelf. Therefore, how can you convince me that it's going to sell? And if 
you know, if you're Cadbury's, Cadbury's launched a new brand last year, goodness knows, they put four million pounds behind that marketing and advertising. Now, your average startup does not have four million pounds. So then what you have to do at the, at the ground level is to establish a rate of sale, whether you're doing it in some local stores or to market, what have you, um, and build up a portfolio of an argument to then be able to go into the retailer and go, look, this is amazing product. There's a gap in the market. This is what you should be selling. Um, and then sometimes you get listings. And then the real trouble starts because then, of course, they order loads and loads and loads, which is what Brewdog went through. And then you've got to find some money very quickly for yeah. that stuff again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, there's almost a, a quandary or a question or like, it's almost like a door that you can't really unlock without either the expertise of the industry. So knowing how the, how the industry actually works. And then combining that with you either got to have the money up front or you need to have this potentially imaginary, you know, agreement with the suppliers and with the people that manufacture everything so that maybe they just take a percentage of how much they sell so that there's no upfront cost. So that might counteract the cash flow argument. But then is it something that isn't necessarily done in the industry, i.e., you could be trying to bang this door down that doesn't exist or maybe it does exist, but maybe there's only a certain few that actually do it. Which kind of, if you're new in the industry, I can imagine that being very, very difficult. So if someone wanted to have this conversation with the manufacturers or with the suppliers, how do they go about trying to set it up so that someone that has this issue with cash flow maybe they're not 100% sure of how the industry works. How do people have that conversation so they've got a better chance of coming out on top? I think it's about building, creating building blocks. So if you look at the way Snaffling Pig have done it, they started with selling, they bought, a, they bought some pork scratchings from someone else, I think, and then they just repackaged them in, in Snaffling Pig packaging and they went around the local pubs and they sold them to the local pubs. And I don't know, they spent 500 quid and they got say a thousand back. Um, and then they did it very organically and they grew very slowly. Um, I think like everything in life now, we're kind of like, you know, we want to be the supermodel. We want to be the, the, the footballer who plays for Manchester United without thinking, you know, that David Beckham was training for 20 years or 16 years before he actually became that that world class and I think I think you have to start slowly um and and test the market and think also about what your skill set is so if somebody's starting a food business or any business really you have to think about what am I good at so you know you're asking me what did I take from Tesco's and Boots all of my life I've worked in retail all of my life I've worked about thinking how to sell products to consumers probably with the exception of now actually as, as food mentor because of course I'm selling services business to business as well as business to consumer because my business is business to business and then obviously my clients are business to consumer um, but you know if you get somebody who's um, I've got a client who's who's very structured and he's quite um, he's quite technical actually he's not a salesperson. So the first thing I said to him is, you know, you were going to need somebody to do your sales for you. And I think when you first go into running a business, you are going to have to do it all, but you need to think what, what am I good at? And what do I need to get someone else to help me be better at? Um, and that can be coaching. It can be mentoring. Um, it can be some kind of virtual part-time help. Um, a balance yeah i mean it it seems at least that at least when you start up you have to try and find people that are good at the things that you're not so great at but don't wouldn't you say that you need to have that experience i guess to realize that you can't do it because some people go in with this oh i'm amazing or maybe they feel like they can do certain things that when when they try it like when they're in that situation, when they have those conversations, when they put themselves out there, ultimately it 
doesn't happen for them. Maybe they struggle more than they thought that they would. But then that is the, the motivation or the, the nudge that they need to maybe try and find someone that's better than they are. So how do you, how do you look at that? I think, I think so what's interesting, there's a lot of talk about disruptors um, in terms of food brands. And I think if you, if you go back to my days when I was working in the big food corporates and we were selling to Tesco's, we were selling to Sainsbury's, there is a high degree of we've seen it, done it. We are going to be innovative. We'll pick up on the food trends, but actually we, we kind of know what works. And when you get a disruptor come in and, and completely change and, and look at it completely differently, there is a degree where you go, that's just mad. I mean, if you look at some of the things that, that Brewdog have done um, and challenged and been challenged in court and been controversial, you look at it, or I look at it from my boots risk averse days or some of the corporate risk averse days, and you go, oh, I can't do that. But if you get somebody who's actually lacking in that life experience, it does make them more disruptive and it makes them look at it in a totally different way. And therefore, it gives them the success um, because they're not afraid to go down the paths that other people are like, oh, I wouldn't do that. Um, so I think it, it, it has advantages, but I think what you need to lay on top of that kind of bare, bare knuckle enthusiasm is some experience of at least of, of finding the, the journey. So you might have an end goal where everyone's going, well, actually, I, I, I think a high quality, I'm going to take fever tree, for example, a high quality mm. tonic's a bit mad and yeah. nobody's going to pay that much for a tonic. And you go, well, I think they will. But then it's how you get there. That's where you then bring in the expertise because actually you might have a goal that's a bit, a bit disruptive, but actually how you achieve that will need some skill sets because, you know, there is, there's a lot to learn especially as an entrepreneur startup, because you've got to learn everything. You've got to learn how to run a business, how to make it, how to market it, how to do social media, how to fill in your tax return. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sure you found the same. You run your own business. You know what it's like. It's, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that really did stand out for me, and I'm going to actually put this in the, in the notes for the show in case people were wondering, is that sometimes not having the knowledge is a good thing. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, as part of this idea of, you know, reinventing yourself and all these sorts of things, there are loads of people out there that learn from other industries. So sometimes like for, for a lot of people, sometimes you can know too much. Like there's, there's, there's almost like a, a lack of creativity, if you will, if you're kind of stuck in the box that the industry has put you in. So the amount of people that learn from like the music industry or come up with a, a business model that's similar to like, I don't know, the, maybe even the, the travel industry or whatever it is, but your actual industry could be fitness or it could be health or it could be clothes or it could be food. Sometimes taking something from an industry that isn't your own can actually be what makes you disruptive. And I quite, that was something that, that I took from what you said, you know, this, yeah. this idea that you've got to try and find out what actually sets you apart. And sometimes it can be knowing less as opposed to knowing more. Like for the for the the vast majority of the people that I've had on this show, in particular, Karen is I don't know a lot about my guests. Yeah, I I, I literally I really don't, and I find that it changes the questions. It changes like I ask people that I already know different questions because I already know the answers. So it kind of gives me the the filter of that. Where I I actually quite like not knowing my guests very well because then I'm asking questions that the listeners would want to know, which yeah. is kind of why I think people tune in. Like people tune in so they want to know about a person from their perspective rather than from mine. And if I've done a week's worth or a month's worth of, of research on a person, I'm, I'm in a good place to ask very, very specific questions. But then someone listening might not really be that concerned about that. They might want to know something different. And I think almost having this, this ignorance, if you will, 
of an industry or of a person or a, of whatever it is can stand you in good stead because then you can start to carve your carve your own path so to speak and you might actually get further than if you listen to other people that are in your industry at least no i think i think that's true i mean i know when we used to go and look we used to do um cost reduction exercises for some of the retailers and what i would do would be you know you would think you would take your production manager and your technical manager around the factory and and go through what you could do but what i would do is take me who doesn't know a lot about factories and a couple of other you know punters who weren't working in a factory to walk around the factory because you start off you go well why are you putting all that in the bin and you ask questions that the production guy would be like well of course we do it like that because of this and then you go well you, you don't need to and suddenly from that i know from that we got a lot of learnings um and a lot of cost reductions because w someone was looking at it from a completely different angle yeah um and i think i think that works to some extent but i think you need at least some sounding boards because otherwise what's going to happen is there's a balance between being disruptive and then going up the learning curve that everyone else has been up and you don't need to go up it and that's what i try and do with with my mentoring is to to stop people going up learning curves they don't need to go up makes perfect sense yeah not <clears throat> not every mountain is is worth climbing you know especially if <clears throat> if it gets difficult at least you want to you want to know it's worth it don't you so before yeah. we get to the the last couple of questions karen i again i'm making a lot of notes on this so i hope the listeners are as well if someone wanted to find out a bit more about you where can people go so this is your chance to share websites <laughs> or social media links this is your chance right okay so i um have a website foodmentor.co.uk so that's pretty straightforward um I, I do put some blogs on there. There's some quite interesting stuff about working with retailers, brands, exhibitions. I'm also quite active on LinkedIn. Um, so you can find me on there. Um, I'm very happy to link in with people. I put a lot of posts, a lot of my activities is around UK retail because that's what I'm most passionate about. So I, I do quite a lot of commentary on what's going on in the industry and trends. I'm on Twitter. Um, which is KG underscore food mentor. Um, I do have an Instagram feed, but I honestly don't use it very much. I'm, I was just say, <laughs> you, you do what, what you know, and, and I have to say Instagram's taken me to the edge of my, my <laughs> learning. So um, I post pictures of France mostly and food. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. But it's food mentor if you want to if you want to look at Instagram and see what I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it could be worse. People do like pictures of food these days, so I know, you never I know. know. Um, you know, I, I think I was reading somewhere that people won't go into a restaurant if, if it's not Instagrammable now, if they're not going to get something that's Instagrammable. So I think it's um, it is it is key. I also have my book, which is Recipe for Success, um, which is available on Amazon and also on my website. All right, Karen. Well, we've we've got last couple of books for last couple of books, last couple of questions for you. And um, I thought we would go down the realm of books, but aside from your own, what other books would you recommend or give to somebody if they want to get into the food industry? uh i'm looking now at my shelves of books that i've read definitely um tessa stewart so tessa stewart's got a couple of books uh one's called flying off the shelf and i think the other one's called packed um so she she's a, a market researcher but she looks a lot into design and she also interviewed a lot of uh retailers to see what would help you fly off the shelves basically those are great books um the christmas book called how to style your brand which i'm just having a look at now uh by fiona humberston and that's kind of like it's a beautifully photographed book um a bit like how you would style your house but it's how to style your brand which is fabulous actually um, and then one which is quite um, 
it's probably quite not out of date exactly but it's a little bit old which was the book the first book that the innocent guys wrote um there's some really good stuff in there about how to, to start a food business oh awesome loads of books there loads of recommendations i like books <laughs> <laughs> Well, as as someone that's written one, I'd imagine you you've done a fair amount of reading yourself. So yeah, I'm not I'm not at all surprised at the amount of books that you recommended there, Karen. Not at all surprised. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've got one last question, and I ask all my guests this. So those of you that have been tuning into the show before, you will know. And if you're brand new, hello. Yes, <laughs> this is the show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the others. And I thought the last question, as always, would be, what would you like the world to know about you that it doesn't already know? What would I like the world to know about me? I think, I, in fact, I, I, I was involved in a, an article in The Telegraph earlier this year, and I think it's important for people to know that I do a lot of marketing, I do a lot of speaking, I've got the book, but inside, like most people, I still sit there and go, what on earth am I doing? And I think that's um, an interesting one. And I think people need to realize that all those successful people like Richard Branson and um, I don't know, I can't even think of anybody else, but the people who are out there and, and you really respect in, in whatever industry you're in, still have those days when they wake up and go, oh my goodness, I don't want to go to work. Everyone's going to think I'm rubbish. I've made some mistakes. And I think it's taken me a long time to be able to come out and, and say that and, and show that vulnerability. Um, and I mean, the Telegraph article is about imposter syndrome, but I think it's more about being aware of, of your vulnerability and being quite happy to, to share it. And I think that's quite quite difficult so yes wanting people to know that i have a vulnerability all right well i'm sure you're not alone and uh <laughs> i'm sure there are plenty of people out there that feel exactly the same way as you i know i have my days i know nearly all of my guests have had days when they think oh here we go again what on earth am i doing so yeah you're definitely not alone karen and Thanks for being a guest on the show. Those of you that are tuning in, make sure you share this one out. Tell people about the show because it's a good one. And for those of you that are brand new to the show, make sure you do check out the other guests. We've got loads of people with interesting stories and insights as well. Uh, Karen, thank you for being on the show. I appreciate you carving out the time and I'm sure we'll keep in touch. I'm sure we will. Much appreciated.